Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm just going to wait a moment for Martin to appear. There he is. So, Martin, I'm going to promote you to the panel and then promote you to co host from there. And then you should be able to share your screen. There we go. And now you are a co host as well. So I'll just. The power is overwhelming. There you go. Hi, nice to see you. You too, Dan. How are you? Good, thanks. So I'm just going to introduce you briefly, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'll, shall I get screen sharing sorted later rather than now, do you think? Oh, so no. I yeah. can see you. I'll just quickly say. Uh, welcome to everybody. This is the uh, fourth UCD Newman Centre online public lecture, uh, which has been a fantastic series. And this week, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Martin Pickup, uh, who's the Turpin Junior Research Fellow at Oriel College, Oxford, and will soon be a senior lecturer uh, uh, in philosophy at the University of Birmingham. So congratulations, Martin, on uh, skilling that position. Very well deserved. And uh, his research um, is um, mostly in philosophy of religion, metaphysics, including philosophy of time and early modern philosophy uh, on a wide variety of topics. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk today. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Martin. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to be here today. Uh, now, I'm going to attempt some trickery. Let's see if this works. Um, you should be getting a PowerPoint screen in front of you. How's that working? It's, yep, yeah, there. Right, so um, hopefully there's something visible to you now. Oh, wait, no, I, I, not to me. Uh, I okay. think when you share screen, it's important that you click on the PowerPoint itself. Perhaps that hasn't happened. Uh, yeah, I did try to do that, but I think because I've got split screen, that might be confusing it. Let, give, just bear with me a second and give me another go. Um, I'll do it a different way. Oh, here we go. No, I'm seeing it now. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Uh, so I think if I try and put it into a slideshow mode, it's going to flip out. So I'll just do it as is. Um, Okay, so yeah, thanks very much everyone for dialing in from wherever you are. Um, I'm aware that we've probably got quite a mixed audience, some people who are professional philosophers and some people who don't have quite so much background in the area. So I'm gonna try and be as accessible as possible. Um, and although we can't be in the same place, so I can't kind of get the sense of a glazed look passing over people's faces as I start talking utter gibberish, hopefully what I say will be um, sufficiently intelligible for everyone to be able to get something from it. Um, right, so um, what I'm talking about today is um, petitionary prayer and a problem of petitionary prayer. Um, so you're going to see my eyes glancing slightly to the side from time to time. So actually, if you... Uh, so that will be me checking out what I'm supposed to be saying. Um, so my question here today is, um, could prayer work? Could it be that making a prayer um, makes a difference to what there is in the world? Um, and that's a question that um, is something that arises for uh, within various re religious traditions. So religious believers uh, sometimes ask God for things in prayer. Um, and what I'm wondering about today is whether or not that makes sense. So there's a number of different sort of puzzles or problems that uh, petitionary prayer gives rise to. Things like how could we ever tell? How could we ever know if uh, something's happening because we've asked for it rather than just would have happened anyway? Or given that God knows everything we're going to do, how could it be that making a prayer makes a difference to, to whether or not God brings something about? So there's lots of sort of puzzling things in the philosophy of religion uh, connected to this question of um, uh, how and when petitionary prayer might be able to work. But I'm gonna be focusing on just one particular issue for petitionary prayer. Uh, and that's the one that you should be able to see on your screen. And this problem uh, says that, well, look, prayer of that sort is going to be pointless. 
Uh, and why is that? Well, suppose I ask God for something which is a good thing to happen. Then it seems like uh, God is going to give it to me anyway. A God of a certain sort um, will just bring about the good things. So if I'm asking for something good, then, um, then God's going to bring it about, even if I don't ask for it. Um, but then on the other hand, if I ask for something bad, then it seems like, again, a good loving God wouldn't bring about a bad thing, even though I ask for it. So if I ask for something which is a bad outcome, then a good God's not going to do it. So again, my asking for it doesn't seem to make any difference as to whether or not it happens. Um, and so whichever way it goes, whether what I'm asking for is good or is not good, it seems like there's uh, not it's going to not make any difference whether I'm asking for something or not. And that's why it seems like uh, there's no point to petitioning prayer. That's the puzzle, or at least the puzzle I'm interested in today. So there's three things I, I want to be trying to do through uh, through this talk. Uh, I've got three general aims. The first is to get clear on exactly what this problem is um, and try to understand uh, how the problem is working and what sort of assumptions are in play in order for the problem uh, to, to, to arise. Um, the second aim I have is to show that there's a, a range of existing solutions to this problem, but I think that they're not adequate. I think that they don't work. So I want to explain uh, it, what I aim to do. My second aim is to show why the existing solutions to this problem are not good enough. And then the final thing I want to do is a kind of more positive proposal is to kind of give an indication of a new route for trying to explore um, ways to respond to this puzzle. And I'm not going to give a fully fleshed out account of uh, how I think petitioning prayer works, but I'm going to give kind of an indication of the sorts of things that might be problematic with the argument that might give us resource and looking at um, petitioning prayer might be able to work despite this argument. So those are my three aims um, for today. Um, but before I get going, um, excuse me, I have a couple of slides because philosophers like to make disclaimers and kind of frame what they are and aren't doing. There's a couple of things I want to set up before we get going into the meat of the paper. So first I've got this disclaimer. So the problem that I'm addressing is a puzzle uh, within certain belief systems, particularly within belief systems that have a certain sort of God in them and where that certain sort of God is supposed to be interacting with humans in certain sorts of ways. So in that sense, it's kind of an internal challenge or an internal puzzle uh, for particular sets of beliefs. Um, and in particular, uh, the kind of background Um, as you might have thought. If you come from certain things. Um, but internal challenge. Nevertheless, it's still going to be something that motivates some interest in trying to get to the bottom of. And I'm just bracketing here uh, a bit uh, kind of an aside, which is that exactly how much of the picture of classical theism is needed in order to give rise to a problem here is something that's kind of an interesting question, um, but one that I'm just not going to go into. So just for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be assuming in the background something like classical theism, where you've got this all knowing, all powerful and all loving God. Um, uh, who wants to have a relationship of a certain sort with human beings. Petitionary prayer, there might be a whole bunch of other benefits that making these sorts of petitionary prayers could have. And this is something that people often say, well, OK, maybe um, praying doesn't make a difference as to whether the thing I'm praying for comes about. But maybe it makes me feel more dependent on God or maybe it deepens my relationship with God or maybe it makes me recognize my own fallibility or maybe it encourages me, encourages me to get out there and bring about the event that I'm trying to 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 to, to pray for. So you might think that, well, OK, petitionary prayer doesn't make a difference because it doesn't change what's going to happen. Um, but nevertheless, it's still kind of beneficial. So in that sense, it doesn't really matter whether petitionary prayer makes this difference or not. 
Now, I think it's true that petitionary prayer can have all of these other benefits, but nevertheless, I think it really does matter whether or not petitionary prayer can make a difference in the relevant sense, uh, for at least two reasons. The first is that I think believers in very many religious traditions, in Judaism, many others, ask God for things. That asking can make a difference as to whether or not the outcome obtains. Um, so look really that there's these other benefits which are unsustainable. And that I think is, is, a, is a big cost of a certain sort. There's a second kind of uh, reason here as well, which is that um, it's an important part of very many religious traditions. So not just the religious believers practice, but of the traditions themselves, that petitionary prayer makes a difference. I mean, it's, in, it's encoded in various religious texts, for instance, or religious doctrines. So again, there would need to be some sort of revision of those um, longstanding religious uh, traditions. Um, if it turned out that philosophically speaking, um, petitionary prayer was pointless in the sense of not making a difference. So I think that if petitioning prayer is, a, is ineffective in the sense that I'm interested in today, then there, there is a substantial departure from the religious traditions and practices that we, um, that we see in the world around us. And that's why I think um, this question is going to matter. Um, even for those who don't believe in the God, as I say, even for those who don't believe in the God of the sort we're interested in, it, it still matters whether or not the religious practices that literally billions of people are engaged in make any sense, philosophically speaking. OK, so that's some disclaimers and a kind of a plea for why this sort of question might matter. Now, next, I'm going to kind of spell out what the plan for the rest of the talk is. So I've got these three aims to kind of explain what the problem is, to show how the existing solutions aren't uh, adequate, and then to offer a different route. And my plan is going to map on to those three different aims. So the first section of the talk, I'm going to be doing some groundwork. I'm going to be trying to get clear on what the problem is by talking about what petitionary prayer is, by talking about what it takes for a petitionary prayer to be effective, and then spelling out in a kind of philosopher's preferred sort of format um, uh, an argument uh, for petitionary prayer being ineffective, a kind of formal version of the argument that I sketched right at the beginning of the talk. So that's the sort of first aim, and that's the first part. Um, corresponding to the second aim, in the second part, I'm going to be outlining why I think the existing solutions don't work. Um, there's a particular premise of the argument that they focus on. Um, and by focusing on that premise, I argue that they don't give an adequate solution. And I'll go into that in some detail in the second part of the talk. Finally, in the third part of the talk, uh, I'm going to offer what I call the kind of route to a better solution. I'm going to highlight a different premise or a different assumption that's in the argument that I think is um, something that can be doubted and give us reasons for thinking that that premise uh, might be false. And if it's false, then the argument doesn't work. So I'm going to talk about some various different ways to challenge that premise or that assumption. And then I'm going to sum up in um, here at, at the very end. OK, at this point, I would usually pause and check that people uh, are following where I've got to so far and are happy with what I'm going to do. But you can't tell me that you are, so I'm just going to have to do it anyway. OK, so um, first, let's talk about what petitionary prayer is. Let's get a bit clearer on the idea of petitionary prayer. So there's lots of different sorts of prayer that people engage in. So if prayer is understood as something like contact with or communication with the supernatural, something of that sort, there's lots of different types of prayer. There's lots of different types of communication of that sort. So for instance, there could be prayers of thanksgiving where we are uh, expressing our gratitude for something in particular or for our own existence or for the world. So there's kind of thanksgiving prayers. There's prayers of contemplation where we kind of try and put ourselves in contact with things beyond ourselves, whether natural or supernatural. And that's a different form of prayer. There's confessional prayer where we might apologize uh, for what we've done or kind of come to recognize ways in which we've fallen short and ask for forgiveness. That's a different type of prayer. Um, so there's lots of different styles of prayer, but the one that I'm interested in today for the purposes of this talk is what I've mentioned previously, which is petitionary prayer. And what's distinctive of petitionary prayer, what makes a prayer petitionary, is, as you might be able to guess, that it makes a petition, that it's asking God for something. So it's characteristic of petitionary prayer um, that it uh, makes some sort of request of God. It asks for some particular outcome. 
Uh, and just as an aside, sometimes this is called intercessory prayer as well, particularly when uh, what we're asking for is asking for things on behalf of someone else. Sometimes this form of prayer is also called intercessory prayer. But that's what petitionary prayer is. And that's the target of the kind of um, challenge that we're engaging in today. Now, the second thing we need to know is, well, what is it for a petitionary prayer to be effective? What is it for a petitionary prayer to work or to succeed in what it's trying to do? Uh, and the answer I'm going to give is that um, a petitionary prayer is effective, at least in uh, one important sense, is effective when it makes a difference to the outcome of the uh, it, when it makes a difference to the outcome we're praying for. So suppose I pray that uh, I find the TV remote, right? That prayer is effective when it makes some sort of difference as to whether or not I do find the TV remote. If it doesn't make any difference to whether or not I find the TV remote, then in the sense I'm interested in, that prayer is not effective. Now, difference making is a complicated notion that philosophers like to think about in lots of different ways. Maybe it's got something to do with causation. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to kind of leave it at a very, fairly general uh, level and just deal with difference making rather than try and make difference making more precise. But just as an aside, particularly for those who kind of are more familiar with this literature or other philosophical literature, it's worth saying that um, when talking about petitionary prayer, normally difference making is understood as what's called counterfactual dependence. So something counterfactually depends on another thing, when if you don't have the first thing, you don't have the second thing. I'll say that again. So a counterfactual dependence is what happens when uh, if you don't have A, then you don't have B. So you don't get B without A, right? So taking away A means you don't get B. That's kind of what counterfactual dependence is. And that is a notion used in lots of different areas of philosophy. And that's often the idea of difference making that's going into this sort of literature. So in those terms, my prayer um, that I find the TV remote uh, makes a difference when if I didn't make the prayer, I wouldn't find the remote, right? There's that kind of counterfactual dependence. Um, but as I say, I'm not going to be diving into the question of exactly what difference making uh, should be construed as uh, in, for the purposes of this talk. The argument works just as well by leaving it um, at a fairly general level. And the argument's what we're going to move on to next. So now we're going to walk step by step through um, the problem as I want to outline it. Um, and here it is on the screen. So the way I presented it right in the first slide was kind of like a dilemma. You know, whichever way you go, the prayer makes no difference, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I think there are some advantages to, and, and actually the dilemma form is the way it's normally presented. But I do think there are some advantages to kind of laying it out in a more kind of formal top-down structure. And here's how I'm choosing to lay it out. Um, so forgive some of the kind of philosopher's preference for formalism. Um, so the first step we have is that uh, somebody prays some prayer for some particular outcome. Uh, so in these terms, I put it that an agent S prays a prayer P for an outcome E. But basically, it's just someone makes a prayer. The second um, step is an assumption, uh, which says that the outcome event or some particular event occurs if and only if God chooses to bring it about. So that is some event happens only if and well, if and only if. God chooses for it to happen. Now that might initially sound a little bit odd to your ear, um, but what's driving this, this assumption is the idea that, uh, at least within the picture of God that we're operating, God is completely in control of the whole universe. God is sovereign. God is uh, all powerful. So the world contains all and only the things that God wants it to contain. It's not that something can be in the universe, be in the world without God choosing for it to be that way. God is in complete control of the world. And if that's true, then events occur if and only if God wants them to. And that's all that's being stated by, no, by number two here. So I think it's uh, plausibly part and parcel of what it is to think of God in the classical theistic picture as God as being all powerful, all loving and all uh, knowing and so on, that God would have this sort of control over the world. So I'm not going to be challenging that particular premise. Um, the next step, step three, is also an assumption. And that's that uh, God chooses to bring about an event if and only if that event is overall better to occur than not. So I'll say that again. So God chooses to bring about something if and only if, or when and only when, the thing that we're wondering about, whether God brings it about, is when that thing is overall better to occur. It's better for the world to contain it than for the world not to contain it. And we're gonna talk about that premise in quite a lot more detail later, but just to give you some 
basic reason for thinking it's plausible, at least within the picture that we're operating. Um, the idea is that, well, why wouldn't God act in that way, right? God is all loving and all powerful and all knowing. So why wouldn't God in choose to include in the world all those events which are overall better to occur and none of the ones that aren't? Um, so as I say, we're gonna come back to that premise later, but that's kind of an initial motivation for it. Next, uh, we've got this step which says that because uh, something occurs if and only if God chooses for it to occur and God chooses for it to occur if and only if it's overall better to occur, then it actually happens if and only if it's overall better to occur, right? There's a kind of uh, a logical step here where um, if this first thing happens if and only if the second thing and the second thing happens if and only if the third thing, then the first thing happens only if, if and only if the third thing. Okay, so that gets us to four. So the event occurs if and only if it's overall better to occur than not. Next, we've got another assumption, and that's that the prayer itself makes no difference to the overall value, or uh, the, makes no difference to the value of the event, and in particular, makes no difference as to whether the event we're praying for is overall better to occur than not. It's a kind of idea that there's kind of this sort of independence of the prayer and the event. Whether we pray for it or not, it's just going to have the sort of value that it has. Again, this is a premise we're going to talk about in more detail, and that's what's coming up in the next slide. So this is a premise that people challenge, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the premise of doing the work here is that the prayer doesn't make any difference to the value of the outcome. And if the prayer doesn't make a difference to the value of the outcome, uh, and the outcome only occurs depending on its value, then the prayer makes no difference to whether or not um, the outcome actually occurs or not. Right. So if whether or not something occurs depends solely on its value and the prayer makes no difference to its value, then the prayer is making no difference as to whether or not it comes about. And that means we can uh, conclude that the, the prayer makes no difference to, its, to, to the occurrence of E. Finally, we've got this assumption seven, which is kind of something I mentioned on the previous slide, which is an interpretation of what it is for something to be effective. What does it mean for a prayer to be effective? And I said there that a prayer is effective if and only if it makes a difference to the uh, occurrence of the thing that you're praying for. So a prayer makes a difference, uh, sorry, is effective only if it makes a difference. And we can see from six that it doesn't make a difference. So we can therefore conclude that the prayer isn't effective. So that's an argument that a particular prayer is not effective. And then because in one, we just picked an arbitrary um, person praying an arbitrary prayer, we can generalize to all cases of prayer. So in all cases of prayer, that prayer is not going to be effective uh, if this, if, if this um, argument is successful, if this problem uh, holds water. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a sense of um, the way that the argument is supposed to run. I'm now going to move on uh, to the second part of the talk, which is to talk about um, the existing solutions to the problem. So the current solutions to the problem, as I kind of um, implied earlier on on the previous slide, uh, reject a certain premise. They reject premise five. And just to remind you, premise five is the premise that says there's a certain sort of independence of the value of the uh, outcome from the prayer. The prayer doesn't make a difference uh, to whether the outcome is overall better to occur than not. That's the kind of assumption that was doing the work in the argument. But the current solutions uh, challenge this. They say, no, that's not true. Praying for things can make them more valuable. And in particular, Praying for things can make uh, the outcome more valuable in such a way that the outcome is now overall better to occur after the prayer, but it wasn't beforehand. So in that sense, prayer can be a difference maker, right? Because prayer can make a difference as to whether or not an event is overall better to occur than not. And it can do so because prayer adds value. Now there's a list of various different philosophers of religion here who've written um, within this sort of framework to offer different sorts of values uh, that petitioning prayer can add. So maybe petitioning prayer extends our responsibility. That's kind of one of Swinburne's ideas. You know, if petitioning prayer can be effective, then we have more responsibility over the world than we do if it's not, because we can affect the world. And that's a good thing. So it's valuable. And so praying for things can add value to the outcome. Uh, and there's other sorts of, I won't go through them all, but there's other sorts of examples too. So each of these authors points to some value that is added by answered prayer, such that that value gets added to uh, the outcome once we've prayed for it. Now, I disagree 
I do, I agree and I disagree with this sort of approach. So I agree that premise five is false, right? But I agree that five, uh, that pray, praying for things can make outcomes more valuable. I agree with that. But nevertheless, I still think that there's a problem here. And that's what I want to go on uh, and explain in the next few slides. So I do accept that five is uh, uh, dubious, that five might well be, not be the case, but I don't think that denying five is enough. And that's what I want to try and persuade you of. Okay, and to do so, we need to think a little bit about what the structure of the current solutions is. How is it that the current solutions are telling us that petitionary prayer works? So notice first that um, prayers adding values to outcomes by itself is not enough to establish that petitionary prayer can be effective. What we need is a slightly more specific claim um, that prayer can be a difference maker for the outcome of an event, uh, sorry, for, for the outcome um, that we're praying for. Uh, and it does so because it tips it from being not better to occur than not to actually being better to occur than not. So um, the metaphor of scales tipping might be helpful here. Um, so what the prayer has to do in order to be effective is not just add some weight on one side of the equation, what it has to do is actually tip the scales, right? It has to be the difference maker. That means that beforehand a thing wasn't going to happen, and then I pray, and then it does happen because now there's more kind of value on one side of the equation than there is on the other. And so the prayer is what's the difference maker, right? Because remember, difference making is what we need for prayers to be effective. So, um, and I've kind of put this kind of in some um, a kind of schematic way uh, using some inequalities. So if um, M is the value of the prayer uh, of the outcome before the prayer and N is the value added by the prayer and V is the value of the uh, outcome not happening. Then what we have is before the prayer, um, the value of the outcome was not um, greater than it not happening, right? It's not better to occur than not beforehand because if it is, then God's going to do it anyway, whether I pray or not, right? So it has to be below the threshold before I pray. But it also has to be above the threshold afterwards. And that's what the second inequality is doing. By adding n, the value of the prayer, what we now have is that the outcome is better th uh, to occur than not. Um, and that has to be the case, because otherwise God wouldn't bring it about even though some value has been added by the prayer, right? Because remember, it's still this difference making notion. So the value needs to be added, that, need, that, it, that is added needs to be sufficient to bring it up above the threshold, right? So that's the structure of these sorts of solutions. Um, but I'm worried about that structure. So I think there are various different kind of problems with this scales tipping type structure uh, of a solution to the problem. Uh, I'm just gonna point out a couple. The first is that the scales are gonna need to be pretty finely balanced for the prayer to make a difference. So in particular, kind of if the value added by the prayer is quite small, then it seems like it's not gonna very often be a difference maker. Right? In order for it to be a difference maker, you need to get things pretty close so that adding a bit on one side tips it from one um, from not occurring to occurring, right? Tips the outcome from not being good enough to occur to being good enough to occur. Um, so that makes it seem like petitioning prayer is only very rarely going to be effective. And that's not kind of like a disaster for the defender of petitioning prayer, but maybe it's not ideal if you kind of think it's an important part of religious traditions that we pray for stuff. If that prayer is only very rarely actually going to make a difference, only very rarely going to be effective, that might seem like it's some sort of a cost. To make it worse, it seems like it, prayer is going to be uh, effective, or at least more likely to be effective, in exactly the wrong circumstances. So earlier on, I made uh, I mentioned the example of um, me searching for a, a television remote, which does happen quite a lot given that I've got a couple of young children. Um, so. It seems like me praying that I find the TV remote isn't really the sort of thing that makes that much sense to pray for. It's probably not kind of that important for me to pray for it. It's probably not the right sort of thing after all to be praying for, or for example, to be praying that my football team wins. That seems a bit like, or that, you know, the traffic clears up so that I get to my um, non-important meeting on time. Well, you know, those are the sorts of things that yes, you can pray for them probably, but they're not sort of the, paradigms of the sorts of things we ought to be praying for, right? They, they're not the sort of things that you kind of think, yeah, you really ought to be praying for that. On the other hand, praying that kind of a relative recovers from a serious illness or that a good friend um, overcomes some serious financial worries 
or that you know the global pandemic comes to a res you know a happy resolution as soon as possible and that you know um a vaccine effective vaccine is found and so on these seem like paradigmatic cases where it's more appropriate to pray it's more important to pray for those sorts of things and um it's more reasonable to do so as well that's kind of how it would seem within religious traditions but the proposal of the scales tipping accounts gets this completely the opposite way around right so Imagine you've got like your weight, which is the, the value of the answered petitionary prayer. If you put it on some scales where the other weights are pretty light, then it's going to make comparatively more of a difference. But if the other weights involved are really, really heavy, like, you know, someone recovering from a serious illness or deep financial worries of a good friend, those weights are going to be pretty heavy. And then your little weight of the uh, value of petitionary prayer is going to be much less likely to make a difference. So it seems like if the current solutions are correct, we ought to spend most of our time praying for uh, really minor things because our prayer is going to make more of a difference. It's going to be more likely to be effective. And we shouldn't really waste our time praying for um, outcomes where there's kind of weighty considerations um, on both sides, where there's a lot of value involved. And that just seems like that gets, that gets petitionary prayer wrong. That's not how petitionary prayer ought to be kind of uh, thought about. Uh, that's not when petitionary prayer ought to be um, ought to be done or ought to be thought about being appropriate. So that's one issue with the current solution, the current solutions. The second issue, uh, which also arises from the same structural um, description, is that it's got this weird consequence, right? So on this view, prayer only ever works when the thing that you're praying for is, independently of your prayer, before you've prayed for it, um, not a good thing to happen. So let me just say that again. So this proposal is that you only get prayer being effective when the thing that you're praying for before you've made the prayer shouldn't happen because it's not valuable. It's not better than not to occur. And that seems pretty weird. And I want to spend a little bit more time exploring that criticism. So um, just to give you an example, because it might help to be a little bit more concrete. So suppose I'm running late for a train uh, and I, I'm about to pray that I catch it. I'm about to pray that I catch a train. On the views we're considering right now, this prayer will only be effective if right now, that's before I've made the prayer, if right now it's not better for me to get the train. Because if it were better for me to get the train, then God's got a guarantee that I get the train anyway. So my prayer is only going to be effective. It's only going to make a difference when right now it's not good for me to get the train, right? It's not better for me to get the train. But what happens is, if I pray in this particular circumstance, say, I add some value of there being answered prayer in the world. And that means that it is better for me to get the train. And so God brings it about that I do. Um, but that just strikes me as a really weird way of thinking about when petitionary prayer can be successful. Um, because we can frame it in this way. So then it seems like God is permitting these sorts of outcomes to occur, not because they're good, but rather because they come along with some other goods, the goods of answered prayer. So in a sense, we're kind of paying the, the world, at least, is paying the cost of having something in it which is otherwise not good to occur so that we can bring about, you know, the value of answered prayer. But that's not what people who are praying think they're doing, right? When I'm thinking about, oh, shall I pray to catch the train? I'm not thinking, oh, well, I'm doing, I, maybe I could make that prayer and that would be effective because then there'd be an answered prayer in the world and that's a good thing. So yeah, I'll make the prayer. No, I pray for it because I think the outcome is good, right? I pray for what I think are good outcomes. I pray for things because I think that they're good to occur. And on this view, that doesn't make sense because if the outcome were good to occur, overall better to occur, then I wouldn't need to pray for it. So it gives this really weird account of when petitionary prayer can be successful. Uh, and as I say, it's not at all, I think, uh, what people who are making prayers believe is happening when they pray. It's not what their intentions are when they pray. So to summarise why I think these um, uh, issues uh, exist with the current solutions. Um, so although I think denying this premise five, the idea that the um, prayer is kind of isolate, isolated in terms of value from the outcome, although that denying that does formally solve the problem, it solves the problem in an inadequate way. 
uh, because it commits to a certain sort of problematic account of how and when prayer occurs. Uh, so I suggest that that's not an adequate solution. It's not, uh, we haven't solved the problem, not the deep problem at least, uh, if we go for this particular set of solutions to uh, the problem of petitioning prayer. Okay, so uh, let me try and be a bit more constructive though. Uh, so this is where we've got to in the plan. We're now going up into the third set of aims that I had for the talk and therefore the third kind of um, the third part. And what I want to do is a bit more constructive, as I say, and offer, uh, if not a kind of fully worked out map, at least a direction of travel for uh, the way, a better way to go, uh, to try and um, give a better, more adequate account of when and how petitioning prayer can be successful. So again, as I mentioned when outlining the argument, um, there's this other premise that we were going to talk about, and that's premise three. Now let me just repeat that for you. Um, so premise three says, God chooses to bring about an event if and only if that event is overall better to occur than not. So God chooses to bring, you know, chooses which um, events there are in the world and does and uh, makes that choice on the basis of the overall value. That's the kind of idea. And as I said, back when introducing the argument, that on the face of it seems reasonably plausible, right? Because um, if we've got a God of a certain sort in the picture, you know, God who knows everything and is perfectly good and all powerful and so on, why wouldn't God create a world like that? Why wouldn't God just create all and only the best events, all and only the ones that are overall better to occur than not? But what I want to suggest in the final um, few minutes is that actually this um, premise, premise three is much stronger and more controversial than it might initially appear. Uh, and so we've got reasons to doubt it. And I've got three different challenges uh, to this premise that I'll walk through fairly quickly. The first concerns uniqueness. So um, suppose that there's kind of some set of or pair of incompatible events, uh, and God's gonna have to choose between them which one to create. What premise three tells us is that there's always going to be uniquely one that's the better one to create. Uh, which is the one that God will create. It tells us that there's one and only one event which is overall better to occur than not. And why is that? Well, suppose that there were two events that were overall better to occur than not, but they're incompatible. Well, then God can't bring them both about because they're incompatible. So um, then this kind of premise three gives us uh, a description of God's decisions, uh, which doesn't add up, right? So that has to be that if this is the kind of condition on which events uh, exist in the world, then it's going to have to sort of arbitrate uh, in these sorts of cases between all of the different incompatible events and pick one of them and only one of them uh, as being the one that God creates. It needs to kind of uniquely identify the one that God creates. But that can be challenged for various reasons. And those of you who are, who are familiar with the kind of literature on um, the Leibnizian notion of the best possible world will see that there's some familiarities um, there's kind of some overlap here with challenges to, to that idea, to Leibniz's idea that um, there is a single best possible world, and in fact that this is it. So here's a couple of challenges. One is that, well, it could be that there are incompatible events which have equal value. And then it's not going to be true that one of them is uniquely overall better to occur than not, because they have the same value. Now, if one of them is overall better to occur than not, then so is the other, but we've already said that that can't happen. Um, so it could be that there are worlds or events which have equal value, but how is God going to choose between them if this is, you know, if three describes God's decision making procedure? Also, there could be, rather than just being uh, incompatible events of equal value, maybe just there could be a hierarchy of better and better and better and better events. You know, you just add some extra good stuff into each of the events. Um, and if so, then none of them is uniquely going to be the best one. You've got kind of an infinite chain of better and better and better possible events, all of which are incompatible. Um, so then none of them is going to be such that uh, it's overall better to occur than all the others. Um, and so again, that kind of leaves God, uh, if God's decision-making procedure is described correctly by three, that leaves God in trouble because God then can't select any of them to, to, to occur. And that doesn't seem right. And then a slightly different sort of challenge along the same lines is that, well, it might not be that two events have, uh, which are incompatible have exactly the same value. It might be that they have values which just can't be compared. So suppose that there are values which can't be kind of put into a metric that can't be lined up and added up and shown to be um, in direct comparison. Uh, 
If so, then God's just not going to be able to kind of compare these two, right, and pick the one which is overall better to occur than not. So to give an example, suppose that kind of, I don't know, beauty has a certain sort of value. I suppose that pleasure, kind of physical hedonic pleasure has a certain sort of value. It might be that those values just can't be compared, right? It might be that the, the value of a beautiful painting and the value of, you know, a really enjoyable swim in the sea, it's not like they you can put a number on each of them and work out which is better. It might be that they just can't be compared. And if there are such values that can't be compared, then there'll be events which exhibit such values and they themselves won't be able to be compared in terms of their value. And then again, three is going to be um, vulnerable because it says that God's going to be able to um, bring about all and only the events that are overall better to occur than not. But we won't be able to determine then, not even God would be able to determine which were overall better to occur than not because there wouldn't be one that was overall better to occur than not in comparison with another. More generally, these sorts of unique, um, the, the uniqueness challenge kind of just shows that the decision making procedure isn't going to sit very neatly uh, with this kind of notion of overall betterness, because it's just not clear that we can uniquely get overall betterness to work in giving God uh, the right sort of decision making procedure for um, which events to include in the world. Okay, so that's my first challenge to, um, to three. And you'll notice that the premise three is along the bottom of, the, of this slide and the next few, just so you can kind of keep your eye on it. The second challenge is about the nature of God. So three uh, sort of implies this view of how God chooses to bring about certain events, God's de decision-making procedure, as kind of, well, the sort of thing that you'd do if you were kind of a superhuman calculator in the sky who sort of just adds in the various different uh, values and sort of gets the calculator out and adds them up and then works out which is best and then picks the one that's best. Um, and that just doesn't sound like it's an obvious account of what a perfectly loving God would be like in terms of God's moral nature. It's controversial. I mean, it's possible for you, don't get me wrong, it's possible to think of God as being kind of like a value maximizer in the sky, as being kind of like an infallible decision theorist who kind of plugs in the various numbers and just gets the spreadsheet out and then it's all sorted. Uh, that's a possible view, but it's not the only possible view and it is controversial. Uh, it aligns in particular with a certain sort of consequentialist understanding of God's moral nature. So God is motivated by the consequences of actions. And it's also intention, although I don't have time to go into this, it's intention with other sorts of uh, claims we might want to make about God's goodness, like God is sinless. Well, that might mean that God can't do anything intrinsically bad. But if doing an intrinsically bad thing led to an overall better outcome, then three would suggest that God would, in fact, do that. So then it seems like God can do intrinsically bad things. And so you can see that there's kind of um, going to be a tension here with other sorts of properties uh, akin to God's perfect goodness that seem to be in various traditions supposed to line up with it. And there are more, there are different sorts of ways of, of thinking about God's moral nature that are slightly more relaxed in various ways. So there's this, in particular, there's this notion of satisficing is a kind of an interesting word. Um, so uh, a God who satisfies would be a God who had to create things above a certain level, right, above a certain threshold, but didn't have to kind of maximize things. Just the world had to be good enough. Um, so the obligation on God in creation, the obligation that was kind of provided by God's amoral nature, wouldn't necessarily be to maximize value, but just to create something above a certain sort of threshold. And if that's true, then three is not going to be the right description of the way that God's going to make a decision about what the world contains. Um, so I'm just kind of laying out the groundwork for showing that there's different ways of thinking about uh, God's choice of what to create. And, and on many of these views, three is just not going to turn out to be the right way to think about it. The final challenge I want to uh, bring up uh, um, is to kind of connect the discussion of three with the problem of evil. Uh, so I think premise three, the idea that God chooses to bring about event, an event if and only if it's overall better to occur than not, does have a quite close connection uh, to the familiar problem, the very deep and difficult problem of why um, an all-knowing, all-loving and all-powerful God would allow a world or create a world which contains evil and suffering. Um, and one way to put that problem, that long-standing and difficult problem, is that God would do exactly what three says. So God would create all and only the events which are overall better to occur than not. That's what God would do. And then we go and look at the world. And the world seems completely full 
of events which are not of that type, of events which are not such that they are overall better to occur than not. And that gives us reason for thinking that God didn't create the world, right? Because if God would have created the world in a certain way where every event that it contained was overall better to occur than not, and we find loads of examples where it seems pretty obvious that this thing is not uh, overall better to occur than not, then the world's not created by God. That's kind of one way of putting the problem of evil. Now, I'm absolutely not going to try uh, in the kind of minute left to me um, to answer uh, the problem of evil. Not at all. That's a very difficult challenge. But what I do want to say is that the existing attempted solutions to that problem can also be interpreted as undermining premise three. Um, so, for example, the free will defense, which says that sometimes bad things happen um, because um, of the consequences of human free choices and that God allows those things to occur because they're human free choices, not because they're overall better to occur than not. That gives an account of what God includes in the world, which doesn't accord with three, which doesn't say that the world contains all and only the events which are overall better to occur than not, because God might have some other reasons for including in the world other sorts of events, events which aren't overall better to occur than not. So various different theodicies, various different ways of trying to respond to the problem of evil are going to undermine premise three. And as I say, I'm not going to defend any of those here, but it's just interesting to note that work in this other area will shed light on um, uh, whether premise three is plausible or not. Um, and from the theist point of view, um, they have a problem with the problem of evil. But if a solution to that problem, even if they don't have it to hand, but e if solving that problem is going to solve this problem too, then this isn't this problem of petitioning prayer isn't an additional problem over and above the one they already have from evil, right? So it's not kind of on their uh, on their list of problems. Um, it's kind of one that's going to get solved if they can solve the problem of evil. So they shouldn't worry about it by itself. That would be one way of thinking about it. Okay. Now, just quickly, I'm going to uh, give you a brief recap with some conclusions. So what I hope to have done, and shortly you'll be able to tell me that I haven't or maybe have done it, is establish the following three claims. Uh, the first is that the typical solutions to the problem of petitioning prayer are not effective, they're not adequate, they don't add up, uh, add up to a, a, a reasonable account of petitioning prayer. The second is that instead of those ways of going, we should instead focus on a different premise, a different assumption in the argument, which was assumption three, uh, about how God would choose to create uh, uh, the world and what events that world would contain. Uh, and finally, um, uh, the third claim that I want to have tried, or I've tried to establish is that the assumption about God's creation of the world, God's creation of which events, uh, which events God creates is also at work in the problem of evil and in fact can be undermined in various ways. So my overall conclusion here is supposed to be uh, that the problem of petitionary prayer was unsolved because the existing solutions weren't adequate, but it is in fact able to be solved, it's solvable. And thank you very much indeed for your um, attention, if you've been paying attention. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin, that's wonderful. Uh, that was a very uh, stimulating talk. And um, I'm going to open the Q&A now. So the way it works in this webinar format, for those who aren't familiar, is that you, uh, if you wish to ask a question or uh, ask for a clarificatory question or whatever you like, simply raise your hand by clicking on participants at the bottom of your screen and uh, clicking on the raise hand uh, uh, icon. And then I will um, promote you to the panel, which will give you the chance to ask your question and speak and so on. So uh, I'll just look for raised hands first. And we have one. So actually, I can do it without that. I'm going to Daniel. So Daniel Wolnoff, I'm going to allow you to talk apparently here. There you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thanks. Oh, fantastic. Hi, thank you so much for that, um, uh, Martin. That was really helpful. Um, a question that I had was, um, so looking at your solution by responding to uh, premise three of the argument, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether you might, in, in, in maybe softening the claim that would have to hold in premise three, you would actually make some space for the responses to premise five to actually do some, some more work than you think that they currently do in its current form. Um, okay. have you, I don't know, I don't really have many suggestions off the top of my head at the moment, but I wondered whether you thought that, you know, it gained some conceptual resources by denying three 
such that five, it, the responses to five are now overall more effective. Um, I'm thinking about scales tipping and those kinds of things with various deontic constrictions, uh, uh, sorry, deontic mm -hmm. restrictions and confinements for God, those kinds of things. Um, have you had any thoughts on that? That's a great question. Thanks. Um, just before I answer it, I've only just noticed the chat that apparently you couldn't hit. I wasn't audible at some times, which might be to, your, to everyone's benefit. But it, it, so uh, apologies for that. And if there's anything that's been missed, I'll be happy to briefly recap. But but Daniel, great question. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, so in a sense, kind of the way I framed it um, deliberately is that um, the existing solutions which do kind of um, uh, reject premise five and explicitly that's the way they try and work. Uh, they're, they're ineffective and so we ought to go my way. But that doesn't mean exactly as you said that the resources from those sorts of discussions can't be redeployed in this, this sort of a way. So maybe I could have been a bit more friendly, but nevertheless, I do think that the way they're thinking about it is in this scales tippings way, which I do find problematic. Mm. So, but I think you're right. So some of the things that people have said about the value of petitioning prayer can be slotted into a view where we're not sort of saying that the value that they're adding is kind of tipping the scales, but rather we're maybe saying something like, for instance, um, there are incommensurate values, sort of values that can't be compared um, between answered prayer and certain sorts of outcomes in the world. If that was mm. true, then praying for an event could mean that that event just kind of has some other reason for God to bring it about, a reason that doesn't necessarily has to have to be that God is a kind of calculator and now the, the equation's changed, but rather that God has certain sorts of reasons for wanting to answer prayers and that gives God additional reasons that maybe make a difference to whether or not God does something mm. um, in virtue of kind of the, the various different options that people have outlined for, um, for value being added by um, by uh, by people praying for things. So mm. I think you're right that there's kind of um, the way I'm outlining isn't kind of in tension with using some of those resources, um, although I think it is in tension with the way that they typically are. Um, people typically try to deploy them. Uh, mm. So I think, yeah, we can be kind of ecumenical to some extent. Okay, great. Is that Thank helpful? You. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Any further questions? I'm looking for raised hands. Um, I'm going to jump in with one of my own, if that's OK. Uh, of course. And then we have Paul afterwards. Thanks, Paul. So I'll just quickly jump in. Um, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering about, um, because you mentioned the problem of evil in particular, and you mentioned in your critical assessment of uh, the initial response, um, the values that we assign to different outcomes. Um, I wondered whether you thought, if you had any thoughts on how this problem interacts with skeptical theism in particular, the mm. view that uh, mm. we can't know um, mm. in some sense what the values of certain events are because they may form part of a, an unknowable uh, plan on God's part. So I, I did, this just occurred yeah. in the context of the first thing because you were talking about, for example, you know, the inconsequential things like the remote, finding the remote and the yeah. consequential heavily weighted things like my friend mm -hmm. not dying from cancer or something and I pray that they, that they survive. Mm -hmm. um, it seems clear to me that my friend not dying from cancer would be a good thing. Uh, and there's no, very hard to convince me that it wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, and so yeah. say, you know, so I, I launch a, a petitionary prayer, um, knowing in a sense, in advance of even making the prayer that, um, or thinking at least that were God to choose the best, this is the thing that God would choose. Um, and so that makes me, that made me think that, I mean, in, in a sense, that cast out on the first, on the response you exactly were trying to cast out on, because um, yeah. you could, you could, you know, one couldn't reasonably have thought, uh, or one, you know, it was hard to see how one could have thought that the prayer would make the outcome of the event better when it seems a clearly good thing that it should happen in the first place. Um, but at the same time, yeah, um, 
I wondered, yeah, so I, I, yeah, so, so, so g given that in your response, you seem to have an idea about certain events and outcomes being better, simpliciter than others, I wondered how, how you thought that it would interact with that kind of question about the ultimate values of things not being knowable to us or something. Yeah, another, another really good question. So I think the, the simple answer is that I think that sort of skeptical theist view will have a lot of impact all through the kind of debate. So I'll try and pick up on a couple of the strands that you mentioned, but, but I agree that it's going to have a big impact. So um, yeah, it seems really weird, right, that um, you kind of be thinking, oh, I'm going to pray for my friend to recover from cancer. But in the kind of structure of the original, the original structure of the existing solutions, you've also got to kind of think, well, right now there's, I mean, I don't know what it is, but there's some huge counterweighing reason or value in this friend not recovering from cancer. Because otherwise, God would mean that the person recovers from cancer. And that, I think, is precisely premise three, right? That God brings about all and only the overall better events. And, and the way it's structured, or at least the way I set it out, um, the existing solutions accept that premise, right? And that's where I think the problem comes. And that's why I sort of try to suggest that the way to go would be to reject precisely that premise. Um, but, but there's an interesting twist uh, in that, um, the skeptical theist approach to the problem of evil is one that is not amenable to the move I made right at the end, where I said, um, many of the solutions to the problem of evil are also going to solve the problem of petitionary prayer. But that won't work for skeptical theism, which is interesting. And the reason it won't work is because skeptical theism, I think, basically says, well, yeah, there are counterweighing reasons. We just don't know what they are and we can't expect to know what they are. And so we ought to be sort of epistemically humble about our attitude towards these sorts of things. But if that's true, then three still is in fact the case, right? God is still, I mean, three isn't explicitly not kind of creation of the best possible world, but it's, but it's quite close to that. So the skeptical theist presumably thinks that the, God does create the best possible world. Right? It's just that we don't know why the best possible world looks like this. Uh, and it seems crazy to us, but then that's because we're so bad at understanding st things. So interestingly, if you go for the skeptical theist response to the problem of evil, um, I don't think that gets you as a kind of free consequence, a solution to this problem. You still have the problem, which you kind of nicely outlined where, you know, I'm sitting down to pray for my friend to recover from cancer, but that's only going to be effective if, you know, there's some counterweighing reason which I need to overcome by my prayer. Um, and that, I think, inherits all the problems that I mentioned. Um, so, yeah, so skeptical theism has kind of an interesting, um, an interesting kind of interaction with this sort of material, I think. And there's more things probably to be said. But, um, um, but yeah, you're right to pick up on that. Thanks, Martin. That's great. Yeah, really good. Um, so I'm going to, Paul, I'm going to turn you on now, as, <laughs> as it were. So Paul, you can thank, you, thank, thank you for that. Uh, Hi. Hi there. Um, I'm studying for an MTH at, at Oxford, so that's where I'm coming from. Right. Um, I guess it's a simple and maybe a stupid question, but if God is only allowing the good things to happen, the, the best possible outcome, Mm. There is a sense that praying itself is not one of those good things that he's allowing to happen. Right, I see. Yeah, so uh, that that's I don't think that's a um, a silly question at all. So, yeah, and I think that is exactly the way that um, the solutions I was kind of mentioning but not really engaging with would like to frame it. Um, so, prayer is a good thing um god wants good things to happen so god sort of sets up the scenario in a sense so that um you have to pray to get something so that the world contains prayer and that means that the world is better off than it would otherwise have been but the trouble with that i think and i'm not completely opposed to that view right it's just what i'm opposed to is accepting as part of a part of that parcel 
that God uh, kind of creates things based on their overall value and that overall value can kind of be aggregated in kind of consequentialist style ways. Because then you kind of think, well, why is God, why would God withhold something good? Uh, is it because God then wants the, um, the prayer to be in the world? So does that mean that beforehand, before I pray, the thing isn't overall good to occur? But it is overall good to occur after I've prayed because, you know, prayer is valuable. And so God wants that to be in the world. As I said, I think that's just a strange way of conceptualizing what it is that people who are praying are doing. Um, they think that they're praying for things which are good. Um, but if they are, then their prayer makes no difference. Right. And given the assumptions that the various people were accepting at that point. So. I think there's a way to say something like what you're saying, which is kind of God wants prayer to be in the world. And so maybe God makes certain outcomes conditional upon their being prayed for. Um, and that, I mean, there's an interesting set of problems to do with that challenge as well, which I can go into if you want. But, but it kind of depends on how we're framing that. Are we framing that in a kind of God's trying to set up the world so that the world contains lots of different sorts of reasons. Maybe they can't all be added together neatly, but um, prayer is going to be part of that. Uh, and prayer is going to be part of what determines God's choice of what to bring about. That's fine. But if it's done in a kind of prayer adds X amount of value, and before adding X, the thing you're praying for was below a threshold, and now it's above a threshold, that I think is a problematic way to think about how prayer can be effective. So I think we might be on the same page, but kind of wanting, what I want to emphasize is that um, even if prayer is a good thing that God wants to include in the world, that's fine. But we've got to think of that not in terms of kind of aggregating values in a kind of X and Y sort of way. Does that make sense as a response? Thanks, that's very helpful. Thank you, Paul. Any other hands, any other questions? Uh, yeah, Daniel, go ahead. Hi, uh, is it working again? Oh, great. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering whether, so, uh, sorry, I've been thinking a little bit more now. So suppose mm -hmm. we have this, like, um, this satisficing approach where, I mean, all you're looking for is creation worthiness. Um, and then suppose uh, we have uh, uh, prayers that, like, are, are like, m like, we have, like, modal uh, constraints now on our and our prayers so like there's some world such that um dan like i pray and that brings about some creation worthy state of affairs and there's an event in which i don't pray and then there's no creation worthy state of affairs and so god has these worlds that right. he can bring about all of which are in the creation worthy threshold but we of course don't have access to know whether or not they are there um, and then maybe you can taper that with some like kind of i don't know some Pascalian pragmatic type concerns that if it seems to us to be good, then we we ought to pray for it because for all we know, they are in the creation worthy set. Um, yeah, that seems right. And, and I think if we go with a satisficing model, we're also able to kind of say a bit more directly, maybe that um, maybe God's created, God's gonna create a world above a certain sort of threshold and whether I pray or not, um, that outcome, um, you know, whether I pray for the outcome and it comes about, or I don't pray for the outcome and it doesn't come about, both of those worlds are above the threshold. Hmm. But the one where I pray for the outcome and it does come about, tell right? me. And that's a reason for me to pray for it because then I can create the world which has the better outcome. And it might even be, right, that. Um, even if I don't pray, the world with the outcome is better than the world without the outcome, but both are above the threshold. So at that point, it's not determined which of them is going to come about. Mm. Right. So because God is satisficing, God doesn't have to pick the one that's better. But maybe by praying, I encourage is maybe the wrong word, but, you know, I, I, I steer God's course of action towards the one that is, in fact, better. And maybe it's extra better because my prayer gets answered and that's good, too. But, you know, there's kind of. It's quite flexible, I think, once you allow satisficing. Although you're, you're, the model you present also works too, I think. But um, I don't think it, I think it can be, yeah. Um, 
if we think about it in terms of giving God reasons mm. for doing things, then as long as God doesn't have to do the best, then um, then I think we can have a quite adequate model of, of how um, prayer can make a difference. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm going to jump in again if, if I don't see any other hands coming up, um, if that's okay, Martin. Yeah, sure. Um, so that it just occurs to me that there might be people listening who aren't used to um, certain uh, aspects of the God of classical theism mm. as he's, or as it's treated in contemporary kind of analytic philosophy of religion. So people will be used yeah. to the idea that God is immutable, perhaps uh, mm -hmm. timeless, um, uh, a perfectly simple, uh, and and at least some of the things you're saying might seem to be at odds with that particular strand of classical mm -hmm. theism. In particular, you talked about just now. But you, what, what what made me think about it was you're mentioning you encouraging God. Uh, yeah, yeah. The very notion of petitionary prayer as something that could affect or touch God in any way um, seems at odds with with at least at, at least on the face of it at odds with certain other views of God's mutability, for example, and and maybe timelessness, and maybe you know. Yeah eternal creation as well, or, or timeless creation and so on. So I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about why those constraints aren't, aren't playing a bigger role or why they're not really constraints at all on the... Absolutely, that's again, a great question. Um, so yeah, there, there are lots more puzzles in this vicinity, I think, um, and you've highlighted a few of them. So yeah, how can we change God's mind? How does that make sense? Um, how can we affect what happens when God creates the world if that's in the past um, if we're thinking of God's creation in the past as determining everything that happens later in a certain sort of way uh, if God foreknows God's outside of well not foreknows okay so God's outside of time but if God knows from an atemporal perspective that I'm going to pray at a certain point in time um, how's the causation working um, and how does God then respond? What, what notion of response can you have from a God that's outside of time? Because that seems like something in time is happening. Then something outside of time is happening, which is God's hearing my prayer or something. And then something in time is happening, but later, which is an answer to that prayer. That seems really puzzling. Um, and so on and so forth. So I think there are lots of tensions here, kind of metaphysically speaking, between the the kind of God of classical theism and petitionary prayer. There are also epistemological challenges, right? How, how could we know that a prayer has been answered? So I pray for something and it happens. So what? I mean, does that mean that we've got evidence that my prayer worked? Well, I could pray that the sun comes up tomorrow. That presumably isn't good evidence that my prayer worked. Or maybe it is, I don't know. So I think these are really, really good questions and they're difficult. Um, what I was hoping to do was kind of pair off just one of them which is the kind of can we make can our prayer make a difference from the kind of god's moral kind of uh, attributes point of view and think about um ways that that could make sense but I, it's kind of disingenuous and philosophers like to do this of course as you well know but you know separating off a problem but yeah but as you said my answer to that problem or my direction of travel on that problem might make these other problems worse or more difficult um that's true. So kind of, I guess the best way of doing it would be to find a way of conceptualizing petitionary prayer that answers all of those sorts of challenges at once. Uh, I haven't got that. Um, but, but it's a good invitation from you to think further about the way in which my kind of um, responses here might interact with the other sorts of challenges that arise for, from, for petitioning prayer from other yeah. aspects of the nature of God understood in that way it also shows how rich the question of petitionary prayer is i think because as yeah. you've seen in the talk you can raise or you can treat it as uh touching on you know those leibnizian questions on the problem of evil and now yeah. we're talking about freedom and foreknowledge and all those other puzzles as well and to, it, a temporal versus a temporal god so it seems to be a microcosm of all mm. the particular mm. problems that people have raised yeah, and, that, and that's what I like about it, um, because I think it touches on all of these sorts of big picture issues, but does so in quite a neat, but also kind of 
experientially kind of dramatic way. You know, it's something that religious believers do all the time. Yeah. Um, I think religious believers probably make petitionary prayers more than they think about the timeless God or freedom and foreknowledge or whatever. So kind of, I think it's quite a nice locus for bringing together a number of different challenges in analytic philosophy of religion and showing that they have a kind of point of contact with religious practice. Yeah. Um, Maeve, yes, I'm going to allow you to talk. There we go. So we have Maeve Cook, one of my colleagues. Hi, Maeve. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not a, um, a, a theologian and I have very little knowledge of religion, uh, but you're, I'm just, I just have a few quest, uh, thoughts as a result sure. of your book, which is of course wonderful. Uh, so I was thinking, well, what if by petitionary prayer, I set myself, I establish a certain kind of relationship with God Hmm. And God has has God is an illuminating force. That's the main characteristic of God. So it doesn't, you know, we don't have to mm-hmm. make assumptions about personal gods and God having will and moral, uh, acting morally and whatever. God is just a sort of a light, eh? uh, a beacon, uh, uh, potentially. But only if I set myself up, establish the right sort of relationship with this source, this illuminating source. Right. So by petitioning, I establish this relationship with the source of you know all uh, goodness or whatever you want to whatever you want to, however you want to call it and that's what's good about petitionary prayer so what would you what would you, somebody like you say to that that's a that's a very naive question. no not at all not at all that's a great question it's a really good question it's a question people ask actually um but it, or versions of it so um yeah i think it's difficult um so I tried to touch, although briefly, on something in the same general vein earlier, fairly early on in the talk, which was kind of like the so, sort of what, why does it matter question? Um, because what I was wondering about why it matters was why does it matter whether petitionary prayer makes a difference to the outcome? And I, the way I'm interpreting what you're saying is kind of, couldn't we understand petitionary prayer as something like putting us in relationship with God, where God is understood in a certain sort of way, and that kind of the benefit of petitioning prayer and the point of petitioning prayer is not necessarily to kind of change what happens in the world, but maybe to change what happens in me or to change my perspective on the world or, 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 or something like that. Uh, is that. Is that kind of a reasonable yeah. way of understanding? Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that's great, right? I think that petitioning prayer often does serve this purpose or at least in the, in, in, in the kind of spiritual life of, of religious believers. Um, and that might be more important, frankly, than whether it means that something happens in the world which wouldn't have otherwise. Um, so although I kind of argued against this, I have thought about it myself because I find that quite tempting sometimes to say, you know, look, there's this philosophical problem with whether or not petitionary prayer can make a difference out there in the world, but that's maybe not what it's supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. But the reason that I kind of have settled, at least for today, <laughs> on not thinking that that's quite enough is because that requires a revision, I think, of what people think is happening, both people kind of individually, but also kind of institutions and religious traditions and so on. I think it's kind of part and parcel of the standard, and you know, we don't have to stay standard, part and parcel of the standard um, Christian, Jewish, Islamic, and so on, religious sets of beliefs that um, not only does prayer, petitioning prayer have this virtue of kind of putting us in contact with God in an interesting sort of way, that that relationship is developed also through that prayer having an impact on the world. Because otherwise, it feels a little bit like, you know, suppose I'm praying I think this comes to a crunch when you think about difficult cases, right? So like uh, Dan and I were talking before about, you know, suppose a friend has cancer. Uh, now, I suppose, you know, and you're praying for them to get better. If someone said to you, yeah, but your prote- prayer really is putting you in contact with, you know, God in whatever way we want to understand God. And there are benefits that come from that. Uh, I think that person, if they're really furiously praying, would say, yes, but I also want my friend to get better. Um, and that's the bit that I think 
I was trying to see whether we could try and keep hold of as well. So it's not supposed to be an either or. It's supposed to be, you know, what you say, and which I didn't talk about, and I should probably have talked about more, I completely agree with. What I'm wondering is whether we can get that extra step as well of there being this sort of quasi-causal connection between our prayer and what then happens in the world. Um, although, you know, how bad would it be if, if we ended up just with the thing that you described? Probably not that bad, because that still sounds pretty good, right? Well, th thank you. Can I just uh, ask a quick um, follow up to that? Yep, of course, of course. Yeah. So um, I know that's really that was really helpful um, and very uh, very clear. Uh, the I mean, what's going through my head is that it, the idea of making a difference in the world it could just be that that is the wrong way to think about it. Yeah. Uh, for people, you know, yeah. it does presuppose some certain certain kinds of authority structures, a certain kind yeah. of God. And, yeah. you know, and these ideas of God do change and have changed. And, it's yeah. not, and maybe the picture is a little bit more complex than the way I sketched it, but, you know, by, by it could be I start off praying for my friend to recover from uh, cancer and to be, uh, for everything to, to, to be fine. But maybe through praying, maybe I, I come to see through praying that this isn't about me <laughs> wanting, you know, yeah. my friend to be in the world, but I come to gain a better understanding of, of um, you know, of, uh, of, of uh, human will <laughs> and, uh, and yep. contingency and and sickness props and uh, um and so on yeah and yeah. acceptance and yeah. kind of what can i do to make their situation better even if that you know and so on and it can have all those sorts of practical yeah. consequences yeah and i mean i'm not against that right i mean and i think that it's important to underline as i probably didn't because i was rushing but that um this doesn't mean that prayer is pointless, right? Although that's the way I phrased it, right? Pointless was supposed to be kind of quite a specific notion to do with difference making in the world. And you're putting, quite rightly, you're putting pressure on that use of language because that seems probably inappropriate. And it's worth saying that even within religious traditions, right? Um, there is kind of a strain of this, I think. So if you think, uh, I know Christianity best, but if you think Think about, you know, uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was supposedly praying, you know, this is, you know, let this cup pass, but thy will be done. That's a strange petition, right? I mean, if we add, but thy will be done on any petition, surely that sort of negates what we're asking for. And so that in that context, but also in other contexts where people talk about, you know, praying, and that brings them to a point of reconciliation with the way the world is or with the loss of a parent or friend or whatever it might be so um yeah i don't think it's straightforward that um we should think about prayer as kind of an input output device where god's kind of like the magician beyond the world who grants us our wishes if we ask in the right way that's definitely the wrong way of thinking about prayer and petitioning prayer in particular um i guess what trying to open the space for was a moderate position where all the sorts of things you're saying get said as well but there's still space for some sort of kind of um consequences of the sort that i was that i was describing but it might but it might just be that for not for this reason or the argument i presented but also all the other arguments that are around petitioning prayer it might be that this is something that people need to move on from we need to revise those who belong to religious traditions need to revise those religious traditions to um, not include something which is philosophically um, unsustainable. That's that's something that could be the outcome, yeah. Thank you, Maeve. And uh, I don't see any further hands. And so, given that it's half past five nearly, I think we'll more or less finished there. So it just remains with me to say thank you to uh, Martin for the excellent talk and for participating in the series. Thank you very much, Martin. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, one of the great advantages of the, uh, or one of the, few, well, you know, side, good, good side effects of the uh, pandemic has been 
um, these Zoom uh, uh, conferences because we can so easily meet now. Um, so thank you very much, and um, just if I and thank you very much to our guests who who came and contributed. And our next talk will be on 4 p.m. Uh, Tuesday, 3rd of November, when we'll have Jonathan Grieg from the Austrian Academy of Sciences speaking about uh, society and religion with Plato and David Foster Wallace. Uh, so thank you very much, Martin. And uh, thank you to Thanks everyone. again, Dan. Thanks, guys. See you again soon, I hope. Bye-bye.